The Pulitzer Prize winning author Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee believes that we're living in an anti-science moment. That's despite new medical breakthroughs helping ill patients defy the odds. He details some of these stories in his new book, The Song of the Cell. And here he is with Walter Isaacson. Thank you, Chris John and Siddhartha Mukherjee. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This great new book, The Song of the Cell, is really the third in a series after your Emperor of All Maladies about cancer, and then The Gene, a very personal book about uh, how the genes determine everything from our uh, health to our mental health. Tell me why you did this book now on the cell. This book is a, a follow-up from The Gene, because while I was writing The Gene, I realized that um, a gene is an incredibly important unit of information that codes for all the things that happen in life. But a gene itself is lifeless without a cell. It's a molecule. It's a chemical. Um, ironically, the gene encoded in DNA, the double helix, has become the icon of life. You know, when you see a por portrait of life, you always see the double helix. But in fact, it's the cell that enlivens the gene. And finally, we're beginning to enter the century of the cell. We're beginning to enter a time when we can manipulate cells using genes, using gene therapies, using medical therapies, etc. It's one of the most exciting times for the biology of cells and learning the biology of cells. And so I thought that this book was very timely to convey the excitement and also the, um, the potential of, uh, of, of what we can do as we learn more and more about cells. You call this book the song of the cell. And it seems to me there's a metaphor there because uh, a cell is like a single note. But when they come together, the song is different. It's greater than just the individual notes. Absolutely. And uh, there are two metaphors there. Um, one is the one you just described, which is that um, multicellular organisms develop songs. Um, they develop songs in the sense that they can communicate with each other. They uh, they, they mix with each other um, and they can create properties, emergent properties that couldn't be uh, present in a single cell alone. So there's a song there. The second metaphor is uh, the one that we started off with, which is that genes um, are like a musical score. But a score is not music. It needs a musician to play it. And it's the cell that plays out that music. It plays out the genome. It plays the the, as it were, the, 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 the score or the orchestra of the genome until it becomes a song. You know, when I was reading your book, it seems like the metaphor is there with the book itself, because unlike some of your other books, it's not just a pure narrative. There's lots of little cells. It's like a collection of cells, your book uh, is, and then they come together. Was that intentional to use the cellular formation as a metaphor for the book? When you write a book as, you know, like the song of a cell, explain the the history and the future and the excitement of cell biology, you have to think about um, structure. Um, and usually, uh, often, often, um, you know, you form, you follow historical narrative, you follow time. The problem with following time in this case is that multiple discoveries in cell biology were happening at the same time. And it would be impossible, it, you'd have to flip from one cell type to another cell type to another cell type another cell type it's not like dna or the gene where you're sort of essentially carrying out a chronological series of discoveries until you find um your your ultimate uh, understanding of the gene in this case there are multiple things that are happening at the same time and cells are extremely diverse and so the only way this book could be written so that it would not become a complete confusion was to really imagine it as a series of almost short stories, each one with its own chronology. So you have a chronology of the immune system, you have a chronology of the formation of bone, you have a chronology of stem cells, you have a chronology of, of uh, you know, blood. Um, so each chapter really is a mini history and put together, it sort of becomes the, what I call the song of the cell. So its organizational structure is both a challenge but also I think somewhat interesting and I would say um, to me at least fun to, fun to write because I could write about each of these separately like little mini chronologies or mini short stories 
that then come together to form a larger picture. Like all of your books, there's, this one's very personal and has very personal stories in it, including Sam, the sports writer who gets cancer. Tell me about him and how the story of his cancer helps you understand the cell. Well, so the book opens with two very contrasting uh, uh, stories, um, both of which involve cancer. So there's Sam, the sports writer, and Emily Whitehead, the um, young lady, young woman um, with leukemia. Uh, in both cases, we use two different forms of immunotherapy. So let's focus on Sam. In Sam's case, we use um, the doctors, use a friend of mine, and doctors use a kind of immunotherapy that uncloaks um, the cancer cells that have cloaked themselves and made themselves in invisible to the immune system. There are new medicines, many of us are familiar with them. There are new medicines that enable uh, us to uncloak a cancer cell because cancer cells build sort of invisibility around them to survive um, the, the, an, an, an immune attack. Um, medicine, these medicines uncloak that, make the cancer revisible or visible to the immune system. The trouble was that when you uncloak a cancer cell and make it visible to the immune system, you also uncloak the normal cells in your body and make them visible to the immune system. And you get, as a side effect of these medicines, you get autoimmune diseases. And in Sam's case, he got autoimmune hepatitis, auto autoimmune disease of the liver. So every time he would increase the dose of, the, um, of these uncloaking medicines, taking away the invisibility cloaks of cancer, we would also, unfortunately, um, uh, spur or spark the autoimmune disease in the liver. And there was no place that we could find in Sam's case, sadly, where there was the exact right level of medicine that would make the immune system attack his cancer, but not attack his liver. And unfortunately, he died because we could never find that right spot, the sweet spot, where we could just attack his cancer without simultaneously killing off his liver cells. Throughout this book, you talk not only about historical figures, but you go back to poets and to philosophers. In fact, you go all the way back to Aristotle in the middle of the book. How does that help us understand? Well, I think it's important to understand the idea, for people to understand the idea that science is, is, is a continuous conversation that, that you know, goes all the way back in human history. It's not like you know, pathology or our, our desire to, to to solve illness suddenly sort of sprung about in the 18th century, uh, or our desire to understand the human body sprung about in the 19th century. People like Aristotle, philosophers like Aristotle and others in various cultures have for really centuries been trying to understand the body, been trying to understand inheritance, trying to understand what makes someone sick. Is it, is it, is it a divine phenomenon? Is it, you know, is it a mental uh, problem? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I wanted to show that there is a lineage of conversation that extends way back into philosophers such as Aristotle. In fact, for the longest time in history, um, they, you know, scientists were called natural philosophers. They were termed natural philosophers because they there was really no distinction made between them and and philosophy. And so it's it's really important to understand that. That lineage is a continuous lineage and, uh, and is, is, is very important for our contemporary understanding of, of science and, and how we do science. And, you know, what we're living in, a, in, in an age where, it, where it, it, it's very, it's, it, we're living in a very anti-science moment, um, politically. People distrust science. People think that, you know, scientists are eggheads who are out to, Make, make the world worse. And it's very important to remember that that's really not the case. Scientists are trying to find out how the world works, how nature works, and, um, and have been doing so not just yesterday or, or day before yesterday. They've been doing so for generations, going all the way back to very revered figures such as Aristotle. In your book and in your book, The Gene, you talk about the mental illness that uh, affects your family. Madness, you say, runs in the Mukherjee family. Tell me about that personal experience and as you deal with it in this book and in the gene, how that drives your thinking. 
Well, the idea of mental illness is 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 very important because it drives um, a, a particular way of thinking of you know about suffering. Um, in this book and in the in the gene, I make a very important distinction between disease and desire. Um, suffering, disease is, is suffering. Disease has fundamentally to do with suffering. Uh, desire, on the other hand, has to do with augmentation, making ourselves better, um, and trying to be, you know, taller, uh, stronger, live longer, etc. Medicine has made a very strong distinction between suffering and augmentation or enhancement. Um, mental illness is an incredible uh, arena where we can really explore, I think, um, our understanding of suffering. Um, and I explore it in my own, in my own family and myself um, and distinguish it from other forms of illness because mental illness, one of the problems with mental illness is that it's very, it's, it's abstract. You don't have a lump in your body. You don't have a, a, a tumor growing somewhere. It is, it is, the state of your brain. Um, and, and therefore, I think um, for many years it was neglected. Depression was a neglected disease. Uh, schizophrenia is a poorly understood disease, partly because they're so abstract. But they, they are very much loci of suffering. And so I wanted to be, be, I wanted to show or demonstrate the idea that there can be suffering um, and uh, suffering that maybe that has, that has to do with genes or with cells that may be more protean and more abstract than, as I said, a lump uh, growing in your body or an autoimmune disease where you have manifestations on, in your skin. Um, and, and I want to show or demonstrate that that suffering is as real um, for me, my family, and for all the people who suffer from mental illness as any other physical manifestation of illness. And that's why it sort of uh, comes, over, comes up in the book in both the gene and in the, in the cell. To what extent are you driven by your own personal biography? Well, the, the idea of a personal biography in a book um, is very important to me because, um, again, um, it's very easy to write a book as if you know, you're an abstract object. Uh, you're, you're sort of the, uh, you're the, you're the, you're the narrator, but you keep a distance from, from all of this. For me, that book is 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 less personal. It's not. It, it's less readable. It's less relatable. I want people to understand that. Who, I want people to understand who's writing this book, and and from what viewpoint, um, and why. Um, what's the drive behind the book? What drives me? Who am I? And and why? Uh, you know, why have I chosen to write this book? What is driving me um, in in this particular book? So. So I find the, the, the personal memoir aspects of it, um, again, enliven the book for, as a, me, for me as a writer, and hopefully enliven the book for the reader as well, because they can understand who I am, where I'm coming from, and, and, and what, drives the, what the drives and passions of the book are. The subtitle of your book refers to the new human. Tell me what your vision of what the new human could be. Well, the new human is a, is a provocative subtitle, um, and um, and it's provocative because uh, you know I think for a long time we've been thinking about the quote so-called new human as a kind of prosthetic sci-fi version, uh, infrared equipped, and what I call Keanu Reeves in a black moon from the Matrix. Um, for me, the new human is not that. The new human, for me, the capacity of cellular engineering, rebuilding bodies through cells, uh, the capacity of cell engineering and genetic engineering. And I told you before, gene engineering is really cellular therapy or cell engineering. If you put the gene in the wrong cell, you don't get uh, any genetic, genetic engineering. That capacity, the capacity to transplant cells, to move cells between bodies, to rebuild the human from our atomistic blocks, from you know cell by cell, as it were, uh, stem cells uh, that rejuvenate entire blood systems, um, the capacity for us to be able to put electrodes in our brains and stimulate cells so that we can uh, battle diseases like, you know, really treatment resistant depression. All of these are to me new humans. Um, these are not augmented humans. These are humans in whom we're using cells to rebuild 
degenerating or, 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 or dysfunctional organs and organ systems and cellular systems such that they can be relieved from, um, from, from dysfunction and disease. You're a great cancer researcher. Tell me what cellular biology is going to do next in our fight against cancer. So um, I would say two things. First of all, cellular biology will help us understand the cancer cell in a, in a, in a deeper way. Um, so far, a lot of cancer biology has been focused appropriately on cancer genetics, which is important. Cancer is a disease of mutated genes. Um, but the cellular biology of cancer still remains quite unknown. So for instance, how do cancers form homes for themselves? How do they draw out blood vessels? I mean, these are questions that have, you know, permeated the field for a long time. We're finally getting answers to them. How do cancers become invisible to the immune system? Why, I mean, this is a very important question, why do cancers metastasize to certain organs, such as the liver, but don't metastasize to an adjacent organ, the spleen? Um, that doesn't have to do, you can read the, the genome of a cancer cell or the genome of a normal cell, but the genome will not give you the answer to those questions. It's only cell biology that will give you the answer to the question, cancer cell biology. And the second is that now we can potentially use our understanding of cell biology, especially the immune system, to direct new medicines against cancer. And it's not just the immune system. There are other systems understanding the homes that cancers build, build around themselves. Understanding how they metastasize at a cellular level will hopefully create a whole new um, vision of medicines that we will be able to use against cancer. So both, I would say, understanding cancer and, and, and directing therapies against cancer depend on our understanding of cell biology and the cell biology of cancer. Siddhartha Mukherjee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Walter.